Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Living Will, Living Well, a series of two webinar workshops looking at advanced directives across Asia. My name is Daisy Chung, and I am Deputy Director at the Center for Medical Ethics and Law, which is the organizer of this webinar series in collaboration with the EFOC Center, the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities, and the Law Society of Hong Kong. My collaborator, Dr. Michael Dunn, is here with me as well, and you will be hearing more from him shortly. Living Will, Living Well is a two-part comparative project, the first part of which is this webinar series, which as many of you will know, was originally planned as a two-day conference in March, but had to be postponed and reformatted for an online audience due to COVID. The second part, which we are very excited about, will be an edited volume containing chapter contributions from each of the jurisdictions you will see here today and on Friday. This book will be an opportunity to explore each jurisdiction in more depth than we are able to in the short time today, as well as the common themes and issues arising from these different regimes. Now, this exploration of advanced directives and issues around the end of life in Asian jurisdictions is an important one, as much of the writing in this area has generally been focused on Western jurisdictions in Europe and the Americas. These jurisdictions tend to have detailed and well-regulated regimes for advanced directives, whereas regulation in many Asian jurisdictions tends to be comparatively simplistic and conservative in scope. The reasons for this difference have not been explored in detail, and through this comparative project, we hope to take a systematic look at this and other related questions. So a bit more about today's workshop. We're very happy to have with us 18 panelists from 14 of our 15 jurisdictions. And as you know, workshop two will focus on Hong Kong in particular. I'll be briefly introducing them before each panel discussion, but due to time limitations, we will have to ask you to read their detailed biographies in our program booklet. We are also very happy uh, to have with us as presenter and panelist today, Professor Richard Huxtable from the University of uh, Bristol, who has extensive experience with advanced directives and end of life issues more generally. Richard will be giving us a presentation on the promise and pitfalls of uh, advanced directives, which will lay out some of the key conceptual and practical challenges that will frame our discussion today. Mikey will then follow with a brief presentation on the common themes and issues arising from the video presentations of all of our contributors, which will lead us to, into our panel discussions with panelists from each of the three categories, well-regulated jurisdictions, semi-regulated jurisdictions, and non-regulated jurisdictions. Each of the panel discussions will begin with a question from Mikey, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. Please remember to put all of your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box, which our admin team will be using to communicate with our speakers in case of any issues. Please note that because we have a large number of participants today, we don't, uh, unfortunately, we don't foresee that we'll be able to get to all of the questions you may have. And in order to make most effective use of our short time with each panel, Mikey and I will be choosing approximately three or four questions from the Q&A that pull together some common themes and issues that all of our panelists can comment on. So for our panelists, please do let me know in the chat box if there are any particular questions you'd like me to choose, or you may just wish to address them in your answers to the chosen questions. And just a final reminder, if our panelists can be reminded to turn on their video function only for the panel discussion they are a part of and the general discussion at the end. So that's it from me. Thank you all for, uh, thank you all again for joining us. And I'm looking forward to a lot of great discussions today. We now turn the time over to Richard and his uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Daisy, and hello to everybody. We're going to move directly to a pre-recorded, my advanced directive, in fact, uh, a pre-recorded presentation from me, but I'll be back for questions later on. The promise and pitfalls of advanced directives. Background. The idea of the advanced directive or living will as we understand this nowadays can be traced back to the late 1960s and the work of Louis Kuttner a human rights lawyer and co-founder of Amnesty International. As he wondered in a paper in 1969, how can an individual who currently lacks capacity or competence retain what Kuttner refers to as the right of privacy over his or her body? The solution, according to Kuttner, is that the individual, while fully in control of his or her faculties and ability to express him or herself, should indicate to what extent he or she would consent to treatment. And Kuttner refers to the document in various ways, including as a living will. 
fast forward to the present day and of course the idea has taken off being adopted in many legal systems and garnering a good deal of support including from Barack and Michelle Obama with Obama noting in a public meeting back in 2009 that it's a good idea to have what he refers to as a living will and he encourages everybody to get one noting that he and his wife have one. But although the idea has support and indeed shows promise Drawing particularly on the paper I cite here, I'll point out some of the challenges and areas of difficulty in order to identify some of the questions to consider when seeking to make policy and especially law in this area. And I'll group these into conceptual and practical challenges. But to give you a flavour of the sorts of things I have in mind, as I wrote back in 2015, advanced directives appear to be beset with problems both theoretical and practical, as they can be, long list here, non-existent, uninformed, imprecise, unavailable, inadequate, unpredictable, unauthoritative and illegitimate. So we'll look at some of these potential problems. We'll start briefly with conceptual challenges. The first such challenge relates to the contemporary ethical basis for an advanced decision, that of respecting the patient's autonomy. This has certainly been accepted as the basis in law in England and Wales. For example, we have Mr. Justice Mumby in an older ruling from 2003, noting that an advanced directive or decision involves nothing more or less than the embodiment of the patient's autonomy and right of self-determination. And we have scholars like Dworkin referring to an advanced directive in terms of respecting precedent autonomy. But this raises a conceptual challenge and question, what is an autonomous decision and what is an autonomous advanced decision? Would we accept one based on a patient's current desires, so their fleeting whims? If you think forward to the next time you have a meal, you might, if that's what's available to you, just carelessly without thinking, grab the nearest available sandwich. But perhaps we'd be better looking to a decision that's based on the patient's best desires, that which they truly value and desire. So for example, if it were me, I'd really be wanting to eat some Indian food. But others would say the decisions we should really be respecting as truly autonomous are those that are expressive of so-called ideal desires. So decisions that align with that which is objectively good for individuals. So some might say that really what I should be having is a salad. Further potential problems arise when we move away from thinking of the basis for an individual's decision to thinking about who is the individual making the decision. Put simply, who is binding who in the case of making a living will or advance directive? There are problems here of personal identity involving such questions as who am I and what makes me, me? The main accounts broadly separate into two crude groups. Those refer to bodily continuity and those that refer to psychological continuity. So essentially, but crudely looking to a mind-body division. It would appear there's considerable support for psychological accounts of identity in particular, but this has led some, such as Buchanan, to point out that presumably a point is eventually reached at which the degree of psychological continuity between the author of the advanced directive and the incompetent individual to whom the directive applies is so small that the advanced directive of the former has no authority at all over the latter. So there are some considerable conceptual challenges lurking behind advanced directives, but on some grounds or other, they still command a great deal of support. So if we move beyond the philosopher's notebook or laptop, perhaps the main problems we should be exploring are more practical in nature. So we'll move to practical challenges. The first of these is essentially what sort of model should be adopted, particularly if we're looking to law or policy. How and where should people's advance wishes be set down? As I pointed out in the 2015 paper, getting the right level of precision appears to be a considerable task, and there are risks of both over and under specification. Not every attempted directive will be worth the paper it's written on, and not every attempted directive will be written on paper at all. So this is essentially about which mechanism or model to adopt. And an advanced directive can take various forms and involve various labels. 
So on the far left of the slide, you have a depiction of Odysseus being tied to the mast on the basis of, if you'll permit me, a verbal advance directive. Written directives can also take various forms. It might be a document using a pro forma or a more subjective variable form. It might be a tattoo, it might be a tag, it might be a card in a wallet. And recall also the various phrases and terms and labels that Kuttner used back in the late 1960s. We have some of this still occurring today. We have reference to advanced decision to refuse treatment in England and Wales, advanced directive in some places, living will in other places, advanced care planning is another phenomenon again. There are do not attempt CPR decisions and so on and so forth. So there are various ways in which people can express their wishes in advance, which model is the one that's right. And once one drills into the detail, one can see that the models can vary in various ways. If we go all the way back to Kuttner's original proposal, as expressed in 1969 at least, then there are certain conditions or criteria he refers to. For example, he wants to restrict advanced decisions to adults who are competent or capacitous. He wants two witnesses can affirm the competence of the patient, but also the freedom of their choice. He wants copies to reside with the person themselves, but also with their doctor, lawyer, and as he puts it, spouse. He wants the directive only to apply once the person is completely and irreversibly vegetative in his words. He wants a committee to confirm the validity and applicability of the decision at the time that it needs to be used. And he wants certain exclusions. So directives cannot, for example, permit euthanasia and directives Compare and contrast that model, the original model, with some of the legal expressions adopted in countries around the world. For example, if we compare Singapore and England and Wales, then the Singapore model appears narrower, more formal and more regulated. As I understand it, the doctor cannot even ask the patient if the patient has an advanced directive. Whereas the English position or English and Welsh position appears broader, less formal and arguably less regulated. I won't talk through all of the differences here, but examples of key differences include differences around witnessing requirements. Singapore appears more in line with Kuttner's original proposal, whereas England and Wales only require witnesses in a specific scenario where the patient is seeking to refuse life-sustaining treatment. In terms of registration, then England has no pro forma or specified form as such, and certainly has no registry. Contrast that with Singapore, where there is, for example, a registry. Equally, the Singapore directive applies in much narrower circumstances. The individual must be incompetent, but also terminally ill and receiving extraordinary life supporting treatment as defined in the 1996 Act. Whereas in England and Wales, we're talking about an incapacitated patient, that's the language of the Act, who essentially could be suffering from any illness and they can make a decision regarding any specified treatment. So there are various differences in the models that are out there, which is the right model objectively, but also which is the right model for the country in question. But let's assume you've adopted your model, then a further practical challenge can be about the existence of advanced decisions or advanced directives. When the Mental Capacity Act in England and Wales came into force, there was a review of its first period of operation, its first 10 years essentially, by a House of Lords committee. And it found at that time, back in 2014, evidence suggesting that public awareness of advanced decisions is low. And within the report, they cite research suggesting that only 3% of the public have made an advanced decision, despite 82% having clear views about their end of life care preferences. Well, one might think that education would work to ensure that people's desires are met by practical steps to make decisions for the future. But there's some cause for concern and scepticism here. Fagelin and Schneider, writing about the United States back in 2004, note various studies that suggest that there are educational drives and propaganda, as they call it, to increase uptake advanced decisions, but they don't seem really to have worked. 
So they say, if after so much propaganda so few of us have living wills, do we really want them, or are we just saying what we think we ought to think and what investigators want to hear? But let's assume you've adopted your legal model, people are becoming aware of it, and people are trying to set down their wishes. Can people actually do so? Can people specify their wishes? Fagelin and Schneider again suggest that this is a pretty difficult task. How easy is it to conjure up preferences for an unspecifiable future confronted with unidentifiable maladies with unpredictable treatments? And how will the patient or person be helped to actually set down their wishes? Can they approach, for example, healthcare professionals and will they help? Well, here, if we go back to the England report from the House of Lords, there was concern expressed about the levels of awareness among professionals of the role and status of advanced decisions. But let's assume you have your law, people are aware, and people have sought to set down their wishes. Will those wishes be accessible at a time at which they're needed? Well, Fagelin and Schneider again suggest that long can be the road from the drafter's chair to the intensive care unit bed. And returning to the House of Laws report, they noted that there may have been a few examples of local good practice, but otherwise the evidence suggested there was no systematic process in England and Wales for the recording, storage and retrieval of this information at the time when the person who made the advanced decision lost capacity. And there is talk of various ways of seeking in England and Wales to ensure that people, professionals in particular, are aware of the existence of an advanced decision. For example, wearing tags, carrying cards, or keeping a note of the advanced decision in one's fridge. But let's go further. Let's now assume that the person has set their wishes down and fortunately the healthcare professionals have actually found the advanced directive or advanced decision. Can it then be applied and will it actually work in the way that the patient hopes and intends? Well, some research suggests perhaps not. A study back in 2003 by colleagues from the University of Bristol used a hypothetical vignette and a hypothetical advanced decision which was circulated to 12 professionals and they were asked on the basis of this advanced decision and the scenario you've been given does this directive apply and therefore should treatment be given or not given you can see how strongly the room was split six of the 12 felt that the doctors in the scenario should not treat five felt the doctors should treat and one felt it was unclear and the authors conclude that advanced directives are open to different interpretations and that anyone creating one cannot assume that any particular outcome will result from its implementation. Outcome depends to a great extent on who deals with the advanced directive. So this suggests that the success or otherwise of an advanced directive is contingent on who's seeking to interpret and apply it. And of course, attitudes amongst those seeking to interpret and apply can vary. It can vary between countries, but it also can vary within countries. Some clinicians, to put this rather crudely, might be more inclined to respect patient autonomy, whereas others might be more inclined to protect welfare or life or protect patients they perceive to be vulnerable. We see some of this play out in Ruth Horn's qualitative research in which she looked into attitudes and practices in England, France and Germany. She found some common messages. For example, there were some shared difficulties around trying to implement advanced decisions, but at the same time, it was also recognized by many participants that an advanced directive is an opportunity to have potentially otherwise difficult conversations about end of life care and the like. But elsewhere, there were differences. For example, in England and Germany, there was clearly an orientation towards respecting patient autonomy whereas in France, the participants appeared more inclined towards treating and therefore towards protecting the patient. But we should not be too reductionist, of course. Similar variation will be seen within one country, indeed, potentially within one hospital or clinic. We in our own research, this is research led by the University of Manchester, in which I was involved in recent years, we've found the similar theme playing out, that of some professionals 
inclined to preserve life, whereas other professionals more inclined to respect the patient's wishes. These two quotations were from paramedics, and the study in question looked specifically at advances in the context of suicide attempts. But again there, we see the same theme play out, this contingency of interpretation and application. And this contingency can, of course, make the import of the advanced decision hard to predict. Will it be honoured, whether in an ambulance, a home, a hospital, or indeed a court? If we look to some of the legal cases in England and Wales, noting that some of these are older, nonetheless, we can see some of the unpredictability playing out. We have, for example, in the 2005 case of NHS and T, a patient who believes blood is evil at the time that they're making their advanced directive is found to have lacked capacity at that time. Another, some 10 years before, who at the time that they were making their essentially advanced decision, believed that they were a world famous surgeon. Nonetheless, the court had no qualms about finding that patient to have capacity for the decision in question. As I wondered in a book back in 2012, there may be some features of the scheme of advanced decisions, at least in England and Wales, which enable, perhaps even encourage, their defeat. So criteria around validity and applicability. There are questions there about how objective these are and how subject they are to individual interpretation. We're back to contingency and in turn, we have unpredictability. So how do we move forward? I am mindful I've raised various criticisms and challenges to the whole idea of advanced directives here. I do think a great many of these can be addressed, but this was done in order to raise some of the questions that we should reflect on when thinking about making policy or indeed law in this area. So amongst the questions we're left with are, first of all, what is the theoretical basis? Now it's worth noting here that usually autonomy, as we noted earlier, and perhaps specifically the idea of autonomy in terms of one's best desires is the theoretical basis for honouring an advanced directive. But here it's worth noting that Kuttner, if we go back to the 1960s, actually located his proposal in essentially the law of trusts. So there might be something to do there, something to consider in terms of what flows from the theoretical basis for supporting an advanced decision. But leaving that aside, let's assume that the idea of an advanced decision is taken to be a good one on some basis or other. Then amongst the practical questions to consider are which model to adopt, a narrow one or a broad one, a more formal or regulated one versus a less formal, less regulated one? How should individuals seek to set down their wishes? Should this be in writing? Is there any scope for verbal directives? Should there be a pro forma or there, should there be a plurality of different expressions? Where should wishes be stored? Should there be, for example, a registry nationally or even regionally? And ultimately, how should people be supported, informed and educated? By people here, we mean not only those seeking to make such decisions, but also those seeking to apply and interpret those. Some degree of consistency is needed but at the same time, the whole mechanism, if at least it's premised on autonomy, should allow for plurality of beliefs and approaches. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that very thoughtful and informative uh, presentation. So we'll now turn it over to uh, Professor uh, Michael Dunn, Mikey, to give us some of the key themes from the presentations of uh, advanced directives that we've uh, received from all of our uh, contributors uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy, and uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody on the call. I'm now going to share my screen to, to summarize some of the points from the video. So give me one moment to do that, please. Okay, hopefully now you can see my screen. 
Um, I'd like to start, like Daisy did, to thank all the attendees for today's workshop. Um, we're very glad to be able to, 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 to focus on this project today. And I'd particularly like to thank the panel members um, from all over Asia who have come together and produced such uh, interesting and insightful videos that summarize law and practice around advanced directives um, in their own jurisdictions. Um, and particularly for adapting to our change of um, delivery mode uh, as we've had to respond to COVID. Um, everyone's been extremely supportive of our change and then has done a great job, I think, in, in putting together the materials that, that, that we're now going to showcase. So just to introduce um, the, the rest of the workshop and connect it back to what Richard's excellent presentation described, um, part of Daisy and I's motivation in, in developing this project was to examine the relevance of this general approach to advanced directives that Richard has described so well, um, including and particularly, I think, the consensus view generally in, 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 in Europe and, and, and the Americas um, that respect for autonomy is the fundamental value that underpins this legal development and practical development um, in those jurisdictions. Uh, we were interested, I think, in part to explore whether the kinds of moves and the kinds of challenges that Richard has described are comparable to what we've seen across Asian jurisdictions. And we, and we think, in fact, this is the first systematic attempt to try to uh, examine and explore uh, comparatively practice and law around advanced directives across Asia. So is there a similar direction of travel that we see in the way that Richard has described, or have Asian jurisdictions adopted quite disparate approaches? Is there similar conflicts between guidelines, law and practice, and the issues that Richard described in Asian jurisdictions? Or do we have a more piecemeal or complex account, or indeed some quite distinctive issues? Uh, obviously, one of the critical questions there that, that motivated us was whether the underpinning value commitments in Asian jurisdictions and the social and cultural values that might inform the development of law and practice are different or comparable to what we see um, in, in, in Europe and North America. So what we uh, will uh, be looking at is a very brief summary uh, and a discussion around uh, 15 Asian jurisdictions and I hope that many of you will have had the opportunity to watch the video summaries associated with the workshop. Those summaries uh, have accounted for the different legal approaches adopted across the jurisdictions. They've examined the, the guidelines and the professional picture uh, in place in those jurisdictions and commented also on the practical reality of the use of advanced directives or not in those contexts. In Preparing the panel discussions, we've made the decision, Daisy and I, to, to um, divide the jurisdictions up into three groups. Uh, when we looked originally at these jurisdictions, we thought there were important differences in the degree of regulation in place across different Asian jurisdictions. And so we've used these three groups, well-regulated, semi-regulated and no regulation, as a way to, 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 to to develop a plan for our project and for this um, workshop. Now, we should say that this is uh, more a rule of thumb than an absolute grouping. So uh, you may very well take the view, I think as we do as well, that there's really a, a spectrum uh, upon which jurisdictions sit. But we're using this grouping just to steward our discussions in a particular way. And those are the jurisdictions within the different groups. In the well-regulated jurisdictions, uh, which we'll be starting with in the first panel, I think we can see that the regulation of advanced directives is commonly but not exclusively situated within a broader piece of legislation. They may well form part of assisted dying laws or mental capacity laws, rather than being specifically focused on advanced directives. And we also noted on some of the videos from these jurisdictions that there's common reference to values like rights and autonomy in how that law is described and implemented. We also noted that in at least three of the five jurisdictions, it looks like advanced directives are limited to the refusal of treatment, not to requests for treatment, but there are some, some, some differences there we might want to explore together. We also noted how within these jurisdictions, different safeguards are in place. 
And these safeguards take different kinds of form in different jurisdictions. For example, in some places, there's a time validity on the application of the advance directive, requiring it continually to be, to be renewed um, at certain time points. There are registration requirements. There are additional limitations in the requirements around terminal illness or life-sustaining treatment. There are specific clauses that cover prevention of undue influence in the application and the making of an advance directive. And at least in one jurisdiction, um, the requirement for approval by an ethics committee in the process of it being uh, applied. We also noted in these jurisdictions that there's no clear relationship between law and practice. That there doesn't seem to be uh, a clear translation of the law into how practice evo has evolved in those jurisdictions. And the complexity here is not simply about practical challenges in implementing the law. So for example, we noted that there were evidence that professional attitudes and value commitments in the jurisdictions held by health professionals could affect how the law took shape in practice. We also noted some tension between the legal provisions and family-centered approaches to decision-making that both family members and professionals sought to adopt by the bedside and healthcare decision-making. There was evidence also of uncertainty about the degree of which patients were actually interested or familiar or motivated to make decisions in advance, perhaps reflecting a more general uh, trend that patients don't necessarily think about decision-making around health matters in this kind of way. We noticed some gender imbalance in at least one jurisdiction about the implementation of these advanced directives. And also importantly, I think a potential tension in some places between a strict regulatory requirement for an advanced directive situated within a health professional model of good practice, which tends to endorse an advanced care planning approach. So questions about how those are aligned. So as Daisy mentioned at the start, we're hoping that all of our attendees will have questions for our panel members. Um, please do post those questions in the Q&A box as we go. Um, but just to get us started for when we move to the first panel, a question for the panel members to think about, please. Um, given that in these jurisdictions there's a clear legal framework in place, how do you think the challenges of applying advanced directives in practice should be best addressed? That's a question that we'll open the first panel discussion with. I'll now move on to the semi-regulated jurisdictions. Um, I think it's important to note here that the regulations typically take a broader form. The regulations might involve softer forms of regulation rather than statute or even legal intervention. They might take the form of, of guidelines, for example. Um, that's explained, I think, by unique factors across these jurisdictions in relationship to how regulations evolve in practical and professional matters. And it has important different implications for how advanced directives might be implemented or, or used in practice. So, for example, we noted that with a broader, softer approach to regulation, there may be varying levels of scrutiny and uncertainty amongst professionals about the deg degree to which they were safeguarded themselves in how they made use of these directives. Also some unclear application, uncertainty about the force of the regulation in place, and some blind spots where potentially certain kinds of decisions were excluded or not commented on in the regulations that were in place. I think semi-regulation also displayed some distinctive practical challenges within these jurisdictions, um, perhaps self-evidently without um, a well developed form of regulation, it was sometimes unclear precisely how to implement those regulations in practice and a diffuse or diverse approach to translating regulation into practice around advanced directives. There also, like the first set of jurisdictions, seemed to be some worry um, amongst uh, uh, the, the panel members and, and the accounts given that uh, people may be, again, unfamiliar with the idea of making decisions in advance or not even understanding potentially that in a healthcare setting they had license to make a decision, for example. And finally, we noted important here also um, multiple um, social and cultural factors that we thought were worth commenting on. So, for example, the, the particular uh, discretion given to health professionals and surrogate decision makers seem to be important alongside the advanced directive. 
There were also evidence in some jurisdictions that patients would take a non-self-centered approach to decision making. So they would, they would see themselves as being reticent to make decisions, uh, not comfortable with the idea of exerting control in that kind of way. There were important points made about the social construction of death and how conversations about death and dying, particularly around those kinds of advanced directives, may be problematic. There was some uncertainty in some jurisdictions about the relationship between lacking the capacity and such that an advanced directive would be applied and broader mental health and mental illness considerations that were sometimes confused in the regulatory space. And once again, some expectation that family members would dominate and have the authority to make these kinds of decisions, rendering the place of the advanced directive uncertain. We also found in, in, in some of our jurisdictions here, particularly those uh, with an Islamic tradition behind them, that there were some additional theological considerations worthy of note. Uh, points made, for example, about the view that God or, or there was divine control over the, 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 the nature of a person's living and dying and that decision making about that really belonged um, to God rather than to the person or the family. And some roles that followed from that theological viewpoint for, for professional expertise and the configuration of the public interest rather than the personal interest. So once again, an opening question for this panel, are healthcare professionals the ones who are largely in control of whether the regulations in place relating to advanced directives are applied or not in practice? And Daisy will pose that question to the panel when we come to it. Finally, jurisdictions with no regulation. Um, here we saw um, a variety of points, I think. Uh, again, a rich, a rich diversity of, of, of practical and legal um, situations. Um, no advanced directives laws, but importantly, some evidence of background regulation that could impact on the use and governance of advanced directives in these jurisdictions. So we noted in some of the jurisdictions um, there may be a broad requirement to consider an advanced directive derived from basic legal duties within a country or potentially the adoption of an international treaty rather than a, a jurisdiction specific law or an advanced decision specific law. And we also saw in some jurisdictions the slow and evolving progress of professional guideline evolution that's given some regulatory um, role to advanced directives, but it remains perhaps um, nascent and in development still. And it's also not clear that this gives rise to um, advanced directives, but potentially alternative pathways for decision making like guardianship. There are also points here, I think, about the practical reality of decision making without regulation. Um, we found it quite difficult, and I think our panel members found it quite difficult to get entirely clear about how decisions are indeed made with or without ADs when there's limited regulation in place. Uh, that might be explained by the fact there's limited interest in exploring that or limited research that goes into a jurisdiction without that framework in place. But some evidence, at least from surveys that have been done, that public awareness and engagement is low. Um, important questions, I think, in this jurisdiction about the status of professional discretion and how that impacts on the scope of practical application, whether the decisions in this context really lie in the hands of the healthcare professionals themselves. And we also saw in at least one jurisdiction evidence of application of advanced directives and indeed advocacy for change being limited to certain social groups, potentially those in powerful positions who wanted to, as far as possible, exert maximum control over their future circumstances, for example. So a broad question for the, for the jurisdictions in this panel, what do you imagine the role of advanced directives being over the next 10 years in your jurisdictions? For example, do you envisage new legislation or regulations being introduced? And just to finish my um, introduction, um, some general points for discussion, I think that we picked up from, our, uh, from across all jurisdictions and that we want to, to think about in relationship to our final discussion, our general discussion after the three panels. Some of these points I think are quite obvious, but I think it's worth making them. Unsurprisingly, regulations across jurisdictions vary widely. There are different degrees of regulation in place. They take different form. They have different scope in terms of the decisions that they apply to. And they also demand different things in terms of their content of people. 
There's also importantly no clear correlation between the degree of regulation and the practical application of advanced directives. We can't conclude, I don't think, that when you have more regulation, you have a, more, a clearer and more developed uh, implementation and practical use of advanced directives. Practical challenges still arise, even in highly regulated jurisdictions. And finally, and importantly, we do see, I think, a variety of social and cultural influences that are important in understanding advanced directives as they're applied in practice. And these give rise to multiple different kinds of challenges, both when the advanced directive is made or not, both in formulating regulations or not, and also by the bedside in the application of the advanced directive or not. Um, we want to make the point, I think, that whilst family-centered decision-making seems to be part of this, and this is a common claim made about non-Western jurisdictions in, in medical ethics, we also noted that there are additional and much more complex social and cultural influences that appear to be at work that are not simply about the family-dominated approach to decision-making. So an opening question for all panelists in our final discussion is to really comment and think a little bit more about these social and cultural factors. Do we think that they are crucial to understanding the practice of advanced directives in your jurisdiction or not? Thank you very much, Daisy. I will leave it there and hand over to you. Thank you very much, Mikey. Uh, so without further ado, let's move to our first panel discussion. Uh, this is the panel discussion on well-regulated jurisdictions. Uh, just a reminder for our panelists in this panel to turn on your cameras. I'm just gonna briefly introduce everyone here and I'm gonna try my best with names, but I do apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. So in panel one, we have from Israel, Dr. Miriam Ethel Bentwich. From Singapore, we have Professor Tracy Evans-Chan. From South Korea, we have Professor Ilhak Lee. From Thailand, we have Ms. Tina Dingam Noi. And um, unfortunately, Professor Daniel Futang Tsai cannot uh, make it today because uh, he's stuck uh, at, at the airport. So uh, let's continue uh, with, uh, with, with our panelists that we have here with us today. And just a reminder of uh, sort of the opening question that Mikey uh, has, has suggested uh, for us to think about is whether uh, given um, given that there's a clear framework in place, how do you think the challenges of applying ADs in practice will be best addressed? So if any one of our panelists would like to take this question in relation to your um, jurisdiction generally, et cetera. Well, if I can just start the ball rolling, um, just maybe a couple of basic points on that general question. Um, I think the experience in Singapore has been that actually a regulation might too easily or either legislation or regulation or both might be too easily seen as a top down move when ADs, at least on the part of the average citizen, is, is, are probably going to be perceived as a very private, intimate issue that has to be dealt with at a personal and a family level. So for us, I think our frameworks or our models are actually in the process of constant evolution. Uh, the, 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 the first uh, and what was is largely perceived as a top-down model, the state deciding this is good for you and we, we provide you with this facility, please sign up, uh, has been largely a failure, I think, in, uh, from most perspectives and most views that I've come across. Um, and it's also about the context and the perceived motivations for introducing legislation and providing the facility of an advanced directive. And where in circumstances there is a suspicion, at least on the part of the populace, that this is in part motivated by efforts at healthcare cost containment and such, that just basically stymies a lot of open or open-mindedness about whether this might be of any value. So, so in, the, in Singapore, the, the process is evolving and the alternative framework is now, uh, as, as some scholars call it, an open communications framework, less concerned with the mechanics and the precision and the certainty and the predictability of, uh, of the process of executing an advanced directive and really um, allowing a much more room for flexibility and communication in order to prepare first and foremost the patient, but also caregivers and family members for decision-making when it becomes real, when it becomes necessary in the moment. 
and and this is seen as a sort of a switch um, and and there's been graded you know a more positive uptake of it but even then social and cultural factors have shown that this is is not the foolproof or highly effective method to get people to think about these issues and prepare themselves. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Tracy. Do we have um, any other views? Uh, Tina, I think you have. Okay, so for me, um, hi, I'm Tina from Thailand. Well, um, I have, even though the Thailand is, is categorized as a well-regulated nation for, for the advanced directive, but as far as I have studied from, um, from Singapore or from, from Korea or from Israel, they all have more, like, more restrictions or more detailed process that they provide for, for the people to, to make the, the advanced directive. Why in Thailand is not, it's quite flexible and that has the, um, and that causes the problems in, in implementation in terms that the doctor will, even though that there is a provision that safeguard the doctor from any liabilities in the future for not um, continuing the treatment. But I'm um, some, this is, 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 is what, what, what the doctors explain their, their concerns about this, like express their concerns about it. They say that um, because in Thailand, they, they don't require any registration of the advanced directive. It's very flexible for doing that. There's no format. There, there's just um, a sample template provided to other, other people, but there's no strict form or any requirement of witnesses. They just require that, uh, they just suggest that there should be the witnesses, but no requirement for witnesses. So the doctor might feel like reluctant to do that in cases that um, the, 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 the advanced directive is, in con is conflicting with our family members. So that's a problem that I, I, I think that um, one thing that Thailand might, might have to solve this problem is about maybe we are too flexible about this. And because it's too flexible about the details and the process, it makes it, um, it's, it's useless in practice because it, um, so it's kind of, it's kind of um, mutual agreement between the family members and the doctor at the time that they have to make decisions. But in case that there are any conflicts, the doctor tend to follow the, the family members because they want to have the cases on, on the court. They don't want to get like, um, get problems in, uh, they don't want to get into problems. So, so this may be one issue that Thailand mm -hmm. might take those examples from other countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Tina. Um, any other? Yeah, hi. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, uh, Miriam Hello, from Israel. Hi. Uh, I apologize. Um, and, and most of uh, the workshop today, today will be using only audio. Um, Israel is currently in a lockdown. So, uh, due to the COVID 19, and, and my uh, internet connection from, uh, uh, from my home is, is not that stable. So, I'm going to use the, the video mainly when, when I'm uh, presenting myself. My apologies. Um, I want to relate to the very interesting uh, question that uh, Professor Dan has, uh, has indeed uh, uh, raised. And let me uh, start by saying that, uh, in a way, I'm a bit uh, amused by the fact that Israel is uh, um, a, a seen as a very regulated, a highly regulated uh, country uh, in terms of advanced directives. Um, in fact, the last uh, slide of my pre-recorded uh, presentation uh, was the following question. Uh, is it, the, in, in the Israeli case, is it the case of indeed a state with highly regulated advanced directives, or is it possibly uh, actually the case of a formal uh, over-regulation that actually leads to uh, under-regulation? And you can understand from, from the question is, uh, from, you know, from, from me um, um, raising this question uh, that probably I think that it actually in the Israeli case uh, tends to the uh, latter uh, uh, option. Um, now, I think that, you know, we can, we can look at uh, different practical uh, difficulties in implementing uh, advanced directives in, uh, uh, in uh, Israel and, and probably in the book chapter, I'd be happy to, to elaborate on it. But I think that if we look at the uh, core underpinning of this over-regulation that leads to at least in my interpretation, to under-regulation in the Israeli case, I would say um, that has to do very much with the religious uh, or, and religion, um, um, a very a prominent and strong role in Israel, and specifically uh, in the dying patient law, uh, the Israeli dying patient law, which 
uh, is the law that, uh, among else, uh, sets out uh, advanced directives. Uh, it is explicitly, uh, explicitly uh, stated by the legislature as part of the goal or the um, uh, purpose of the law that when enact, enacting that law, not only morality and ethics are taken under consideration, but also, and not le and, and on a, I would say on an equal uh, basis, also the uh, religious perspective, mainly being the Jewish uh, religious perspective or the Jewish uh, halakhic uh, law, the Jewish uh, uh, traditional law. And I think that as long as that perspective is quite overruling uh, in the Israeli uh, case, and particularly in the Israeli dying patient law, um, the ability to actually um, um, implement advanced directives in, in Israel would be uh, uh, still quite uh, limited. Great, uh, thank you, Miriam. Um, so, uh, Ilha, you wanted to... to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will start with the, um, my case starting opening question that culture should be a factor. It should be some, it uh, acts like some factors in developing policy and laws. So, because the law cannot, uh, law is always reflect the public attitude and understanding of, about the death and dying. But at the same time, law leads the, the practice, medical practice. So after the legislation, Korean doctors and healthcare institutes are uh, adopting, adapting to the new legislation. They are actually, they are learning how to discuss, converse, com uh, how to uh, discuss with the patient and how to give some counseling the family members and all the uh, and the patients so uh, law cannot cannot be made uh, without the public or, or cultural background but at the same time it leads all the practice so but in my the current experience tell, tell, tells that culture is has much major force in the changing uh, attitude toward the advanced directive. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Ilhak. So these are all very interesting points that I'd really like to pick up on, but we have uh, a few questions in the Q&A that uh, we should um, get to. So um, let, let me pose the first um, question um, that, that we've uh, chosen. So um, do you think ADs are needed for patients to have a good death? This is quite, a, quite an interesting question. And um, we've sort of uh, expanded this question a little bit more, which is, does the fact that there are regulations on ADs in place contribute to enabling a good death? So the first part is, do you think ADs are needed to have a good death? And do you think the fact that there are regulations on ADs, does this contribute to enabling a good death? So if anyone... Um, Wants to take this question. Well, yep. I think people, some patients can be assured when they have written the advance directive and share their decision with their family members and their wishes known to the medical doctors. So it makes them feel much more comfortable. But we, in Korea, we don't have very good evidence about their quality of life after advanced directive is respected. Uh, we have analyzed the healthcare insurance uh, utilization uh, in less than two years. But what is interesting is they've spent more money than before. The, those people who wrote advanced directive and their wishes were Respected, the more, more expenditure was spent. Uh, we don't know the reasons, but anyway, uh, we're gathering some uh, experiential evidence that people feel much more comfortable. And so we can say that advanced directive can contribute. Actually, we don't know how much they contribute, but we can say that the advanced directive is necessary. For, 
for good death. Mm. Yeah, so, so it gives them a sense of comfort. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, anyone else? Well, so, mm -hmm. so yeah. that, that depends on what, what, uh, uh, what uh, that, that how, how each culture or each nation divide good death. But if you like you consider the good in, in general terms that we are, that, that we, we mutually understand as such, I think um, the, the advanced directive can contribute to the, to the good, to the, the good that to some extent. But of course there are, there are, there are like that, that, that depends on the details of the, the details on the advanced directive that you allow the patients to, to divide on that. And, and also the fact that um, I have seen that in other, in other nations, I, oh well, the first thing is that um, for the advanced directive, um, the concept behind um, the, the concept that is a basis for the advanced directive is about respecting the personal autonomy, the, the person's autonomy. So this is a concept that we should respect it and we should preserve for, for that. And that could ensure the good life to some extent. But the thing is that um, because in other, na in other, in different countries, we have different degrees of, of allowing the advanced directive. Maybe we can allow, um, in some country, we allow the family members or we can authorize uh, this, uh, the, the attorney to, to make a decision on behalf in the best interest of, of, of that patient. So, so that would, would come to the debate, so whether that really comes to the good death of, of, of that person. So I think it, it depends, but it contributes to some extent because it ensures the, um, the, that it protects a person's autonomy. Yes. Great, thank you, Tina. If I may. If I may. Yeah, Dr. Uh, I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of advanced directives, but yet I would believe that advanced directives do not affect every life. I think the vast majority of people would not be, their lives would not be changed, their end would not be changed by the presence or absence of advanced directives. However, there is going to be a small percentage, maybe a very, very minuscule percentage who could be really helped because of advanced directive. And we must work towards the advanced directives for those people, like one of the cases which we put up. The lady who went into a persistent vegetative state in 2005, and she continues in, the two th uh, in that state till today, 15 years of unconscious sort of PVA state, could have been avoided had there been advanced directives available at that time. So it doesn't affect everybody, but a small majority, a small minority, where it does make an impact. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gray. Uh, did, did Tracy or Miriam want to say anything? If not, we can... Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think uh, I'll try and build on what has just been said by the other panelists. Um, of course, much depends on what we conceive to be a good death. And I think um, at least for a multicultural society like Singapore, um, we have to you know, be clear that there might be very different conceptions of what a good death are. Some might be more centered on the fulfillment or, or the uh, meeting of wishes and expectations on the part of the individual. But often we find that to that individual, what a good death means also encompasses loved ones and families and how they themselves go through that process. So, so given that kind of uh, assumption that, you know, how do we work with different conceptions of what exactly a good death means? Uh, I would say, um, you know, as other speakers have said, it's, it's not necessary, it's not essential, but it might be an important piece in the puzzle or in the challenge or resolving how to, to achieve a good process or experience of dying uh, for, for at least two reasons. One is, um, you know, as in many, many other places, uh, not every individual is embedded within a healthy, supportive family environment where the whole process can be experienced together in mutual support. And, and in that respect, you know, I'm thinking of, of persons who live in unconventional situations, uh, to speak generally. I'm thinking of persons, uh, we have a growing proportion of the elderly uh, who are single, who live on their own and, and don't have the kinds of relationships that you can fall back readily on in order to you know, 
avoid the need for an advanced directive. So I think there's certainly a role and it certainly has the potential to help certain groups of uh, individuals uh, achieve, if that's the right word, achieve a better death or better dying experience. Um, and the second one is really uh, contingent on the way your healthcare system is organized. Right, so one big challenge in the Singapore healthcare system is the, the siloing of different forms of healthcare so that the one patient is often thrown about through the system uh, and you do need a way in which, you know, these communications can be reliably recorded and communicated to different healthcare individuals where increasingly in the modern healthcare systems around the world, experiencing healthcare tends to be more and more alienating, right? Doctors are no longer in that traditional uh, long-standing, well-known, familiar relationships. Often doctors you encounter will be strangers that you've met for the first time. And, and that's where I think some form of advanced directive, however, however we choose to define it, will be very important in sustaining some of these communications. Yeah, thank you for all these um, great points. Uh, we just have um, time for, for one more question. Um, and so we, we see some other questions there that actually are uh, will be relevant for later panels. So uh, we'll come back uh, to those uh, when we get to the later panels. But just uh, one last question uh, to the panel, uh, uh, the well-regulated jurisdictions. Is the concept of living will used across your jurisdictions? And do we think that uh, terminology matters uh, when we're uh, looking at the regulations that have been put in place. So how important do you think, um, so, so first of all, is, is living will uh, used as a term or is it advanced directive or uh, what kind of term is it? And do you think uh, what it's called uh, really makes a difference? Thank you. If anyone wants to take this. Yeah, we, we are using some different terminology for advanced directive where we, in, in the current translation, it is advanced statement on life sustaining treatments. It means that the Korean attitude toward living will uh, or, or advanced directive is a rather uh, limited one. So they don't regard it as a directive, but it's only some reference for the decision-making you know, advanced statement. So it shows that the Korean law, uh, Korean law is, is not open or ready to embrace the patient's autonomy directly. Uh, so I think the terminology sometimes matter. So we, we have to be very careful using advanced directive, but in many the current, the professionals use as uh, advanced directive or the patient order, something like that. So there is some confusion in, in the terminology. So living will is sometimes communicable, but anyway, uh, the, I think the terminology matters. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and sort of advanced refusal, advanced uh, directive, all of these terms can mean very different things. So yeah, the, the confusion might exist. Uh, any, is there anyone else who might want to? Um, just very briefly, uh, yes. I mean, especially if you're trying to sell a new concept to the population. So in, when our first framework was uh, being promulgated, uh, some care was taken about what terminology to use. And it was thought that an advanced medical directive was uh, clearer and more specific than the, the, the phrase living will. Great, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, just, just, just briefly, um, my, just my opinion for uh, like so short. It's, it's, I think the terminology matters in the term that we can get the people to understand it at the first instance that they heard about this concept and they try to get to understand this. But in well, well, but actually, I think the, the most important thing is not about the terminology only, but it's about the definition of how we define living will or how we define advanced directive. I think I think that, that that's very like that that's more important. But okay, the terminology is is important to some extent yes. because in Thailand we still use it like because we use the Thai words, but in in like in promoting the term we use um both the living will and the advanced directive. Okay. Yeah, great, thanks, uh, Tina. And uh, if Miriam, if you wanted to add anything. Um, okay, so um, I think, um, unfortunately, our time is up for, uh, sorry, uh, Miriam, did you wanna? No, um, I just wanna say that uh, in Israel, both uh, um, concepts are used, although in the uh, official law, 
uh, it is the concept of uh, advanced directive that is uh, Right. Great. That, that's very helpful. Thank you all very much for this uh, great discussion. Unfortunately, we didn't have the time to really pick up on a lot of those issues that um, came up, a lot of the sort of social cultural issues, religious issues, a lot of these issues that are really worth uh, sort of looking into at a, at a deeper level. But unfortunately, um, the time for this panel is up, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back to some of these issues uh, in later panels or in the general discussion later. So um, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the panel on semi-regulated uh, jurisdictions now. Uh, our panelists include from India, we have Dr. Ravindra Gui uh, and Ms. Kelly uh, Drew. And from Iran, we have Dr. Zain Abbas Saeed. And from Japan, we have Professor uh, Satoshi Iwata and Professor Satoshi Kodama, Dr. Reina Ozeki Hayashi. And I think uh, Ms. Miho Tanaka has uh, not been able to, to stay for the rest of this, but um, she's been part of the project. And then uh, from Malaysia, we have uh, Professor Sharon Kaur, and from the Philippines, we have Professor Leonardo De Castro. Um, so just as a reminder of the question that Mikey uh, posed in, in the beginning, uh, something that we might want to start off with is whether um, healthcare professionals are largely in control of whether the legal requirements relating to ADs are being applied uh, or not in, in practice. So if um, anyone would like to take this question um, to, to begin with. Sort of whether the doctors are the ones who are largely in control. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I'm you you can go ahead, uh, Miss. Okay, thank oh, you. Um, just to jump in, um, in India, at least as far as the Supreme Court guidelines are concerned, all the panels, all the three committees that can potentially be constituted to determine whether or not advanced directives should be applied are mainly comprising of doctors. So, in that very literal uh, sense, absolutely, that would I would, I would agree with that. And this is also in practice, sort of not just in the determination of the rules, but also in practice as well. Is that right? I think so, yes. Uh, uh, Zane, I think you wanted to say something. Okay, there's a, there's a contrary view. I think Dr. Gui doesn't agree. But, oh. uh, <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, what I wanted to say that so few of the Indian doctors know about advanced directives. We did a survey which took the highly qualified doctors in India of 147 doctors we surveyed. And we found that less than half of them know what advanced directives are. So even if a person has advanced directives, he goes before a medical team, which doesn't know what an advanced directive is, then it's absolutely useless. So I wouldn't say that they're in control at all. Thank you. So they don't know much about it. Okay, thank you. Um, and sorry, uh, Zane, you were going to say something. Thank you. So um, I think in Iran, it's, it's interesting um, if, if you manage to, the participants also managed to look at my presentation that the, the surrogate decision maker actually is in control of whether the advanced directive is, is implemented. And that's because in, in Iranian uh, law and practice, as soon as a patient loses mental capacity, automatically by law, the Islamic court is meant to appoint for them a surrogate decision maker be there an advanced directive or not. And actually the advanced direct, the, the, the action or of that advanced directive is the surrogate decision maker. But we know that that doesn't happen in practice because of its impracticality. And actually what happens in practice is that physicians um, exert greater control. Um, but but, but it, the, the issue here is that how, how much does a physician want to switch from a family centric model of patient autonomy to a self-centric model of patient autonomy. When we can see that in Iran, for example, in my own experience when I was working there uh, for a short time, and also from what we can see in the literature, that even in capacitous patients, um, physicians will consult the family and inform the family about treatment decisions because it's not seen as compassionate to even talk to the ill patient, even in, in, in the context of their capacity, to talk to them about their diagnoses or the risks of procedures and that sort of thing. So why then would that same physician move to a model of self-centric autonomy once that patient lost capacity? Because it would, just, it would not be in keeping with what they believe is a compassionate way to practice. So I suppose what, really, what, what, what this really boils down to is how, how much do Iranian physicians want to advocate for or do they believe in the necessity for a cultural change towards more self-centric autonomy as opposed to family-centric autonomy? 
And in that sense, they are in control, therefore, of how much they will push for reg regulation or changes in practice. Great, thank you. Um, Hi, Daisy. It's Sharon here. I think that's a really interesting question. And while at some level, yes, I would say that the physicians are in control because they get to decide whether or not to, um, you know, give credence to the, the wishes of, of the patient who's non-capacitors. But I think in the absence of actually having a proper legal authority, physicians are probably very unlikely to want to go against the wishes of family members if they tend to conflict with the wishes in the advanced directives. So I think that control is, is a very weak control. And, and given the lack of, of legal authority behind the advanced directives in a semi-regulated um, jurisdiction such as Malaysia, I'm not quite sure whether control is the appropriate word. And if I can just take two seconds to hijack the question from, from before about um, whether they're necessary for a good death, I think closely linked to this idea of control, I think they are particularly necessary in the Asian context if you are perhaps in a non-traditional family relationship or you might have values that conflict with your family and your community. Because I've had people ask me, people who are in same-sex relationships, if I sign an AD and if I ask my partner to be um, the surrogate decision maker, what happens if this actually needs to come into to play and, and my family doesn't like my partner because they don't approve of my relationship. So I think for these sort of, of, of relationships or people, I think it does then become a necessity for them. Thank you. Thank you, that, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Um, would anyone, mm -hmm. Professor Iwata? Yeah, may I? Um, I'm not sure I can uh, um, answer the uh, question correctly, but uh, the, I'd like to uh, uh, point out three uh, points. Uh, I think Japanese situation is rather uh, behind from uh, many other countries. Uh, we are three, you know, still in process of the development. The main uh, mechanism of regulation on end of life is a uh, health ministry guideline. But uh, those who understand uh, uh, about the health ministry guideline uh, well is still very low. So the, uh, not many doctors uh, understand uh, it. But uh, even though the, uh, uh, I should say that the healthcare professionals are largely controlling whether to apply uh, advanced uh, directive or not, or whether uh, even to start advanced care planning. But uh, one good part of the, uh, the health ministry guideline is require involvement of, of not only patient and family, but also doctor, nurse, and uh, care uh, specialist. The, uh, this requirement try to prevent a situation, a single doctor dominated situation. So that is a, a little bit uh, improvement. Uh, uh, and then last part is uh, uh, although we do not have an uh, effective enforcement or safeguard, uh, there are uh, always uh, uh, possibility of whistleblowing in which many medical uh, professionals want to avoid. Recently, there is one case, uh, the patient uh, uh, husband claimed that the doctor refused to uh, return to dialysis, even the patient asked to do so. So uh, there are huge mass media coverage, and then this kind of scandal have very strong deterrent effect. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you, Professor Iwata. And uh, if uh, Professor Castro, if you yeah, if you want. Hi. To yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, and Sean was made earlier uh, of uh, patients or relatives not being used to making decisions in advance. I uh, would like to uh, say actually many patients or their relatives they're not only not used to making decisions in advance, they are not used to making decisions at all for themselves. And uh, this is a primary reason why I would say that healthcare professionals are in control 
But when I say they are in control, what I mean is that they are in control of situations where advanced directives may be needed. But when they make decisions, they exercise their control without actually making or having to make a reference to advanced directives. Uh, they exercise their control because patients or their relatives largely defer to the uh, wisdom of healthcare professionals. Now, in situations where the uh, uh, practitioners are uh, minded to encourage patients or their relatives to make advanced decisions, the responsibility usually falls uh, on a dominant person, a dominant faculty member. Uh, and this dominance is likely to be exercised by a, uh, a, a personality, an individual who has the capacity to pay for the expenses. The reason for that, or one important reason for that, is that while we now have a universal healthcare law in order to facilitate the coverage, the um, we're just starting with the system and many of those cases where these decisions have to be made are uh, ones that require expensive procedures that are not yet covered by the uh, universal health care law. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor De Castro. So uh, just actually, uh, this next question follows on uh, quite well from this uh, discussion that we've been having here. Um, so perhaps we can expand on um, some of your thoughts if um, there's no one. Uh, so if there's anyone else who wants to contribute to the previous question, you can add on, I think, to this one, which is um, whether you think that the term autonomy in your jurisdictions is different from the West. Uh, and being so being family focused as opposed to being individual centered, for example. And um, to add to this, how may this challenge um, that the doctors turn to the family instead of the patient um, be addressed? Um, how, uh, if, if, any, if anyone can respond to, to these questions in terms of you know, what, what autonomy means and how you deal uh, with the family. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say, uh, uh, the exercise of autonomy in any situations is the exercise of decision making, not by a single individual, but by a family unit. Um, so that when doctors think that they have to respect uh, patient autonomy. It doesn't mean respecting the decision solely of the patient, but of the entire family. So, um, well, I'm not saying that that happens in all the cases. Uh, that is quite a dominant uh, perspective that we come across. Great, thank you very much. Um, if anyone else would like to sort of jump in on this question. 
Mm. I would just like to add um, um, something there that, yes, I, I completely agree with, with, with what was said in, in the sense that one can still be autonomous if they imply that they would prefer that their families make decisions for them. Um, and I suppose coming away from a more sort of a culturally imperialist way that we want to bring Asian countries into self-centric autonomy, if actually what's common and practiced and comfortable for them is a more consent towards family-centered decision-making, that's sort of one aspect. But I suppose the other aspect that we need to focus on is from the medical perspective, we know that the evidence shows that when patients' autonomous, in one sense, self-centric decisions are involved in that shared decision of treatment, that will actually enhance the medical outcomes for that patient. So if our approach towards the issue is that, yes, although we appreciate that culturally family-centric autonomous decision-making is what is practiced and comfortable, but actually if we want to push healthcare forward in Asian countries, and we know the evidence shows that self-centric autonomy provides better healthcare outcomes for these patients because they are more involved in the, in the risks of those decisions, as well as actually what is it that that patient expects from treatment themselves then we might think that actually there might be more of an onus towards shifting culture in Asian countries towards a more self-centric or a more balanced approach towards autonomy. Great, thank you. Yeah. And sorry, Sharon, I think you wanted to... Yeah, I just had a quick point. Because again, you know, this is a really great question and it's so nuanced because I think that there is a truth that uh, from the literature that we've looked at that um, patients tend to view their decision-making process um, as connected to a family and it's, it's, you know, they want their families involved. But at the same time, there also seems to be a certain vulnerability, especially when we um, looked at this piece on elderly in, in nursing homes, where they were economically vulnerable and they felt that they needed to um, consult or, or almost to, to agree with their family because their family were, were paying the, the way of the patient. So again, I think, a recognition of the importance of, of maybe the role of family in the Asian context, but not again then legitimizing it and saying, well, in all cases, the family should be given a role because sometimes I think it can be coercive and sometimes it can be um, absolutely just um, a, a conflict situation and bringing them in doesn't help. So I think it's, it's a bit more nuanced. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, if I, if I may. Um, well, the thing is that uh, there has been traditionally a skepticism towards the role of family as far as the Indian Law Commission reports are concerned. Um, um, so that was the resistance towards the okay decision making and so on. Uh, so that's a, you know, to, to generalize and say that it's individual autonomy versus family is, I'm not sure if that actually holds true. Um, and also, I think as far as the, the legal status is concerned, I think autonomy is looked at more as an ideal um, as compared to something uh, that is like in practice, a decisional autonomy on behalf of the patient or so on. Maybe exactly like an ideal being strived, uh, that the legal system seems to be striving towards. So that might be quite disconnected from the practice. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, if um, anyone from uh, Japan would want to weigh in on this particular question about family autonomy and sort of personal versus individual autonomy. Well, um, in Japan, the, most of the physicians tend to care about the family decision making or the family wish rather than the patient. However, because not only be affected by the family-centered issue making, but also the physician tend to care about the rest of family life after the patient death. So they want to, uh, they don't want to the family, uh, family uh, hurt. They want to, they don't want to hurt the family feeling. So uh, maybe the physician understand the importance of the patient autonomy, but they care about the family feeling. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, we have two minutes left. Um, th this is a rather complex uh, question, but um, if we just sort of wanna address this uh, sort of um, briefly if we can. Uh, so the question is what counts as regulation in your jurisdictions? Is there a blending of different kinds of regulations and does this pose challenges in practice? 
So what, what kind of regulations do you have? What, what do you consider regulations? Um, is it a problem that there's so many different kinds of regulations? Anyone? Well, we have, we have the uh, um, mental health law. Uh, uh, so it is a law that provides for advanced directives. Uh, we also have uh, guidelines, uh, uh, for example, the most recent example uh, uh, consisted of the guidelines pertaining to care in uh, COVID-19 uh, contexts. And uh, when we wrote the guidelines, to healthcare professionals, the healthcare professionals in the writing group were insisting that we should have specific provisions pertaining to advance their activities. So it is a blend of legislation and uh, great uh, thank you um if anyone else would want to okay uh so um thank you all so much um for uh participating in this panel discussion a, a lot of uh very interesting again very interesting discussions that um that um hopefully we'll have time to pick up on uh, later, but uh, we will have to, uh, because of time, move on to our last panel. Um, so our last, thank you very much, panel members of this panel, and uh, we hope to see you again at the, at the final discussion. So the last um, panel is our panel on uh, jurisdictions with no regulation. Uh, our panelists include from Macau, Professor Vera Lucia Raposo, from mainland China, Dr. Bo Chen, uh, from Russia, Russia, Professor Olija Patrol, and from Turkey, Professor Dr. Yasim Isil Ulman. So uh, for this jurisdiction, um, uh, sorry, for this uh, category, uh, Mikey has uh, as a question, an opening question, uh, which is what do you imagine the role of ADs will be over the next 10 years? Uh, for example, do you envisage new legislation or regulations being introduced? So um, if anyone wants to take this question. May I start? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you open my... Okay. <laughs> I started by... Hi, everybody, again. I'm, I'm, it's so beneficial. The discussions and the presentations uh, have been quite beneficial for me uh, up to that point. And then I would like to start and uh, put it briefly. I agree with my colleagues, Dr. Professor Chan and Professor Gui. Uh, Chan says that this is not... Uh, look at this. This is a beneficial fund. It's quite useful for you. Uh, look at this is a living will agreement and please sign it. That track, that approach will take us to um, a failure, he said. I totally agree with him. And another colleague from uh, Dr. Gui from India, perhaps, uh, said that it may be a useless procedure, process to do it this way. So uh, instead, uh, on behalf of the countries or uh, uh, on behalf of my country who is uh, uh, who hasn't uh, regulated the living will and advanced directive uh, uh, a country like that and then i think that there has to be uh, more steps to be taken beforehand uh, for answering the question uh, what do you think uh, how do you envisage the 10 years perspective uh, that was marky asked us and then um, there are, um, um, for instance, as you know, uh, you, will, you are so familiar with what, what the things that I am going to say that we need public participation, public engagement, multi-professional uh, um, uh, uh, discussions, uh, multidisciplinary uh, encounters, and then to discuss the matter uh, from social, cultural, professional, uh, humane perspectives, and that's what I, what I want to tell. And then 
uh, we need the involvement of professional society, civil society, professional uh, societies, and patient rights uh, societies. Uh, I think these are the steps that must be taken before regulating the uh, living will as a beneficial and useful um, legal document uh, uh, in order to have in order to have a successful process with, uh, uh, ahead of us. And then, um, but uh, I, I want to end what an academic like us, like me, can do in this process. What, are, what the contributions may be to this 10 years perspective. Uh, I can uh, uh, shortly say, briefly say that, first of all, we may have, we may play two roles, I think, to initiate, to encourage academic, social, civil societal, policy makers, encounters, um, uh, discussions, and then uh, we can listen to each other, understand better the needs of the society. As uh, you may have seen in my set of slides that uh, legal uh, uh, jurists and also uh, health care professionals think that uh, it is uh, uh, we need to do regulate uh, regulate uh, living wills and advanced directives and then uh, we see that there is a basis and uh, foundation in uh, in, uh, in the in Tur regulation in Turkey starting from the Oviedo Convention also the patient rights regulations but there is no um, a specific regulation dedicated to living will. But uh, there is also a, a vitro drawback uh, in this discussion. It may be confused. The living will may be confused with the euthanasia. Uh, so we should, uh, so the, uh, it takes us to our role again uh, uh, for the society to clarify the terms and then uh, all the instruments to uh, uh, to process by uh, organizing um, uh, uh, multi with multi stakeholder uh, uh, meetings and then we have to understand each other and secondly we have to conduct we need to conduct studies qualitative ones preferably to understand the needs of the person human being uh, in order to achieve this. Um, autonomy, individual autonomy, uh, community uh, pressure or duality. Uh, and then we need to, uh, 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 so we are also so, uh, uh, ready and then we, we should like to collaborate and cooperate with these internationally collaborated studies over understanding, for understanding the living will and advanced uh, uh, directive processes and then also the end of uh, and point the, um, the documents. And then um, I, I think lastly, uh, I, I, I have to emphasize, I think that the societies are not stiff materials. Uh, so societies are, uh, are in, uh, uh, they, they, they uh, are in the process of constant change. So the norms are not so, uh, are also solid and stiff ones. It change. It's 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 it, it has to change due to the uh, person's human being's needs. It, it is in the change. That, that, that's what I try to uh, uh, tell in my set of slides. And then we need to uh, learn more about the country practices. That's why I attach so much importance to your workshop to understand the country practices the regulated ones, the semi-regulated ones, also non-existent ones, uh, like Turkey. And uh, uh, lastly, I would say that there is a foundation, again, I repeat, to do it, but there has to be more steps to take in order to, these are my envisages, my visions about the 10 days, 10 years, um, uh, 10 years imaginations for, uh, for a new regulation. I hope I can answer Mikey's question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Yasin. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and Vera, you wanted to, to say something? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. So uh, I don't think in Macau in the near future we will have any regulation on advanced directives. It's not a concern. It's not a matter discussed. Uh, in general, informed consent is not that discussed. Um, funny enough, even if the lawmaker today decides to create a law on advanced directives, chances are that in 10 years from now, you won't have a law because the amount of time that uh, 
laws, especially in healthcare, take to be decided and discussed, often to public discussion. So in the end, even if we start today, we will have a law, I don't know, in 15 years from now. But can I just, could you let me very quickly come back to one of the questions, the one if, uh, let me see, if advanced directives are necessary for a good debt, because it has been a widely discussed question. Well, in my perspective, uh, advanced directives are not a matter of debt, they are a matter of autonomy. And um, because look, there are many regulations on advanced directives, uh, the one of my home country, for instance, in Portugal, in which it is allowed not only for the patient to refuse treatments, but to clearly express the kind of treatments that he or she would like to receive if the person were in a given situation. Of course, it all depends in many other issues, like the doctor can say, I will not provide this treatment because I don't think it's correct, or there may be uh, economic limitations. But the advanced directives are not only to refuse treatments or to uh, request that, so to say, but also to um, clarify the treatments that we, are, that we want. So it's a matter of autonomy, which I don't think is a fiction. I don't think it's something utopic. I think it's something very real, of course, depending on how it is regulated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. And if uh, Bo or Alicia wanna... Uh, yeah, my turn. If I may, or... Yes, please, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, to simply answer the question directly, I, I think it's 10 years too difficult to, you know, to tell, but I think in the foreseeable like five years, I don't think that there are any possibility that we can have a law or like a well-regulated uh, piece of regulation to cover this issue. Um, but I want to reframe this question a little bit differently because as I present in my, you know, pre-recorded presentation, like there are actually uh, like uh, the a code of ethics for the for the medical professionals in China, I mean in mainland China, and uh, it, it went so quietly like six years ago, and uh, suddenly we have this thing, and no one really care about it, and no one discussed about it even. I ran a search about you know the the Chinese literature, like academic literature, and there's zero uh, serious discussion about this code of ethics. And I tried to run some you know search from the legal database, and there's no single case concerning this code of ethics. So I think to me, the problem is not really we will have a law or regulation or like we, even though it's not well regulated, but there is something, right? So like if people really want to use them, so there should be some evidence that people are really using them. So my concern is about how people can make use of this, you know, even though very premature uh, set of regulation or rules, but people, you know, I, this, let, this concern me more seriously than you know whether we have a new regulation because unless there are very strong motivation from the ground even though we have a law something like it, it, it will still remain silence for the next six years just like we have the code of ethics so that's my response to this question great thank you bo and uh, alicia if you have anything you want to add yeah let me give a brief comment um, so my comment is the following. Uh, in Russia, the law as it is um, clearly does not uh, allow to ensure that the wishes uh, given in advance are respected. This is clearly. And to change this uh, situation, uh, we need, need to change the law. Um, if you are asking um, whether this law may be changed in next 10 years, I can easily imagine that the law is changed because uh, generally, um, Russian uh, developments uh, in Russian law are very dynamic. I can easily imagine that even in five years we have some regulation uh, if the voices are raised uh, and if um, healthcare professionals speak to lawyers and meet lawyers because for now this does not happen. Uh, and second condition um, and, and at the same time a reason uh, is that um, in Russia, we have uh, bigger problems uh, unresolved in the area. For instance, um, we even uh, don't have a good practice how to cope and how to, how to cope with the situations where, the, where people are in coma, because we have some strict legal concepts like incapacity, which triggers some regulations and a situation where a person is in coma is not regulated at all. 
uh, and for instance, um, the wishes of the relatives are not respected. And a very um, uh, tragic, but uh, a good illustration uh, of the state of the issue, such issues in, in Russia, is a recently um, widely reported while, uh, worldwide uh, a case of Alexei Navalny, a politician who was poisoned in Russia uh, and whose wife uh, was simply refused um, to get any information about his health, uh, was not allowed to even contribute to a decision or to opine on the decision uh, whether the um, uh, politician who, who was in coma may be transported um, to Germany for a treatment. Uh, so, um, uh, to sum up, uh, I believe that once we resolve very basic questions, and once the healthcare professionals speak to lawyers, uh, and thanks to such conferences uh, as this conference, I see no obstacles to get this issue resolved um, at the level um, of uh, introduction of new regulation in Russia. Great, thank you. Um... It's all very, very interesting. Um, uh, be because of time, we will probably have uh, enough time for one more question. I think this might have been addressed uh, a little bit in some of your answers, but um, the question is whether palliative care should be made available to all patients with serious illnesses before considering regulating advanced directives. So this is um, a question sort of about, the, you know, going back to the question about uh, 80s and, and whether they enable good deaths and um, whether sort of more should be done uh, before we consider sort of putting 80s in place, legislating 80s, whether palliative care is being done well, whether it should be done better in your respective jurisdictions. Uh, if anyone wants to take this question. Yeah, can I, can I take um, very briefly because, you know, I, I understand this, I mean, how important it is, you know, to, to make an informed consent or inform other ones to actually, there's a whole range of things like we can think of can improve you know, the practice and the procedure. But my point is, I mean, all these things are necessary and will be helpful. But my concern is more about, yeah, at, at least to these jurisdictions with, with, with no regulation. So is any, all the considerations are relevant, but to us like uh, having it operated first, I think is the number one issue to me, because even though, even though it is not legally binding, but at least if you, you have some advanced wishes on the record and it may improve the communication between the doctor and the patient, right? Even though it may not necessarily have a legal force. So I, I mean, my short answer is everything is helpful and every consideration like this will be beneficial, but we, we, we need to make it move first, right? So that's my concern. I'm, I'm sorry for not being very helpful, but as that's a sort of answer for me to all these kind of issues, right? Is, it, is that necessary to try something first? Is it necessary to better regulate the registration process? Yes, all of them are necessary, but we, we need to make a move first. Thank you very much. There needs to be more of an impetus, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Bo. Vera? Oh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think they are not uh, mutually excluding themselves. One thing is palliative care, of course, very important for uh, under the perspective of some patients, and this should be provided to every single patient. It mostly depends, in my view, on the economic resources of the, of the healthcare service, of course. The other thing is for patients that do not want palliative care or do not want any more because they may uh, change their minds at any given moment, if they want another kind of um, medical care, because even even I, I assume that even when you say I don't want this treatment, this is also medical care. You are receiving some medical care. You are not being provided any given treatment. So both things should be guaranteed, and um, they are not so to accept one is not excluding the other. Thank you, Vera. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, and then Alisa. Mm -hmm. My answer to this question is both yes and no. Yes, uh, palliative care is, uh, uh, service is given, is provided, uh, and also no, because there's a problem of, uh, this is a health coverage issue. So how much you spread the health, healthcare services, you provide healthcare, healthcare or uh, countrywide. This is, a, uh, I think this is the, the my, my second answer is no, because, uh, 
health equalities uh, uh, is relevant to the health inequalities in a society. But I know that this is not only the problem for Turkey, it is a universal problem. And then, uh, uh, and the, the wishes of the patients are, are is it, are they considered, uh, if you ask, during the palliative care uh, process? The answer is yes, of course. And then perhaps no, because of they cannot have access to healthcare. So both, uh, we have to, uh, is it, my answer is, that's why is uh, yeah, both yes or no. But I think uh, my colleagues in the uh, in the panel in this panel uh, answered back uh, in a similar case and similar uh, vein. I think that's my question. Okay, the you. answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, Alicia, yeah, last thought. Uh, my quick comment uh, is: I believe that uh, both areas are equally important. Uh, I can say that. Um, uh, and development of one should not um, hold development of the other. Uh, in Russia, palliative care is in a quite a poor condition. Uh, it is rapidly developing, I would say, thanks to charity organizations, uh, but, but it's still in a poor condition. Uh, and not available uh, to, to everyone. But at the same time, I do not see uh, why um, this fact alone should hold a development of advanced directives. For instance, because uh, there are many individuals in Russia, uh, probably uh, mainly among the wealthy individuals uh, who have um, their foreign advanced directives, for instance, made somewhere in Europe uh, which uh, would hardly be enforceable in Russia if something happens with them in Russia. So, uh, uh, and uh, I do not see why such, um, why we should not work at the same time uh, on ensuring that such wishes are respected and develop, of course, palliative care uh, in Russia as well at the same time. Great. Uh, thank you so much um, to this panel and all the members of this panel for your uh, uh, very insightful responses to the questions. Uh, so just um, so that's uh, that concludes. Uh, unfortunately, that concludes our panel uh, for this um, for, for the jurisdictions with no regulation. And we just have about 10 minutes left for our general discussion and Q&A. And I'd just like to hand the floor to, uh, uh, so, so if all of the panel members um, uh, could all join this panel by turning on your video cameras. And if I could just uh, turn the floor uh, to uh, uh, Richard to just give us some broad reflections on sort of what we've been discussing um, so far. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Daisy. And thanks very much, of course, to all our panelists and indeed to everyone for the questions, which have really made me think. I don't have any answers as such, but a couple of quick reflections from me. I'd group them around two key words for me. One would be clarity and the other would be compatibility. So on the clarity point, I was really struck by, for example, Tracy's reference to Singapore and using the precise language of advanced medical directive. So there's a challenge there for us, exactly what are we talking about? There are different interventions, different labels. So there's something there about clarity. On compatibility, I found myself thinking, if you'll forgive me, the, the metaphor of square pegs and round holes. What I'm thinking is we want a regulatory approach or broadly an approach that uses the right tools for the job, number one, and number two speaks to the cultural society in question. So in terms of the tools for the job, I think this has been running through a lot of our discussion. What sort of regulatory model, if at all, is appropriate? And including in terms of this compatibility aspect, what's right for the context in, in question? If we think back to Ilak's um, observation earlier from Korea, he was noting that law can lead values, lead a society in a sense, but it also reflects the society. So those are two of the things that are running through what I'm hearing, a really rich discussion. But I'll pause and hand you back to Daisy. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Um, so just to, to make sure we can get to as many questions as possible, uh, we have uh, a question from the audience that can um, sort of get us started, uh, which is, uh, it's a big question, uh, so we can just see uh, sort of how much we can take. Um, so uh, uh, by with each jurisdiction. Uh, so why, why do you think AD is such a marginalized topic in Asian countries? And whose role do you think it is to push the discussion forward? If anyone wants to to take a stab at this question. Sorry. 
So there's sort of elements of this question that have been addressed by many of you in your answers before. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, in my presentation, I mentioned a uh, number of things, including the fact that uh, there's, there is a fear among a lot of people uh, talking about death evokes uh, could, could lead to unwanted outcomes. Um, secondly, patients in many of our contexts are expected to rely on the family for decision-making. So the sick person is a vulnerable person and a vulnerable person needs a non-vulnerable family member to speak for her. Uh, and the third one, in a Catholic uh, Christian society such as mine, in my country, there is the notion that uh, making this decision for oneself violates or takes over a role that God himself should play. I'm not saying that these are valid reasons. I'm just reporting what studies have actually shown. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the issue of religion has, has sort of come up in, in some of the other uh, jurisdictions as well. So if any, uh, anyone from, I think, um, in Israel, uh, Iran, I think religion seems to be uh, some, something that has uh, come up as well. If someone, or if there are any other sort of reasons why you think ADs have been marginalized, please. Um, yes, if I may com comment. Yes, please. Yes. Um, so, um, as I uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, in Israel, uh, uh, religion is, is very much influential. But what I didn't mention, uh, and I think that this is part of the, um, it, it has to be stated, um, that despite the fact that it's part of the law, okay, in terms of uh, what uh, uh, Richard has uh, 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 applied to uh, in the context of uh, compatibility, uh, if you look at the Israeli population, most of the Israel, uh, Israeli population is not religious, certainly not ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, religious, uh, which is the, uh, you know, more or less the, the, uh, the guidelines of the current Israeli law, namely the dying patient law, is very much uh, um, uh, within uh, or from a perspective of, uh, from the uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, perspective. So actually we have a case of a law that is not very much compatible with most of what the people in the society actually think. And the only reason why this is the case is due to internal politics. Namely, it, it does not relate much to culture, but more to internal politics that lead to a very, uh, in this case, cultural or religious uh, influence, but but not out of a, a, a wider cultural a social perspective, but actually out of a internal a, a politics a, 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 a mechanisms or or a, a, a outset. Um, so that's one point I want to make. The the second point, if I uh, if I may, and that is uh, actually going more to a, 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 I would call a other softer cultural um, influences other than religion. Um, we had a very interesting um, a, a study conducted a, a couple of years ago, um, that was a mixed method study uh, in which we asked uh, and interviewed also um, both physicians and nurses from different wards in, uh, in a central hospital uh, in the northern uh, part of uh, Israel. And we wanted to uh, specifically look at possible differences between uh, main ethnocultural groups in Israel regarding the perceptions of physicians and nurses 
uh, about uh, communication with uh, communications with uh, their uh, dying patients uh, concerning uh, their approaching death and of course uh, uh, including advice uh, directives uh, and the comparison was between uh, Israeli uh, 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 Jews born in Israel uh, 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 physicians and nurses that are from the Arab sector and also uh, physicians and nurses that uh, 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 originally uh, immigrated from a, a former uh, from the so a former Soviet uh, Union and I can tell you there were uh, distinct differences between Israelis uh, uh, Jewish Israelis that, uh, that uh, uh, Jewish that Jews that were born in Israel, namely uh, what we call Sabras, and the other two uh, groups that are actually minority groups in Israel, namely so-called Russians and the Arab sector, where uh, those that uh, were born in Israel were much more open in their, communicative, uh, in their communication with uh, patients and their willingness to talk about end of life, uh, mention advanced directives and, and so on. So the, there are uh, certainly also uh, uh, differences uh, that are uh, uh, influenced by uh, uh, cultural uh, um, uh, uh, perspectives. Great, uh, thank you, Miriam. So uh, we have a couple of minutes left. If we, uh, if anyone else wants to, so Yasim, you want to respond? Yeah, I think it's a good summary uh, of Richard's sentence: "Law leads values and reflects society." It's quite important, I think, and I would like to add that. Uh, um, I see that, I think that uh, this is a human rights issue in the end. So uh, dying honorably and dying in dignity is a patient rights. So uh, uh, advanced directives and then uh, living wills are part of this discussion. And then whose role, who should take the first step is, is not a good question. All of us are responsible to do that. We should do our contribution, play our role, do our responsibilities in order to reach to this end. It's a human rights issue, that, uh, um, that's what I think, and uh, you should deserve dying in dignity. And then it's a matter of, uh, 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 the, 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 let's say, um, value of life, including the end of life, and then uh, advance uh, end of life uh, in, uh, in an honorable way. That's, that's what I see and look at the issue. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Yasso. I think that's a, a great note to uh, end our conversation today. So unfortunately, um, that's all the time we have today. And that brings us uh, to the end of today's workshop. Uh, thank you so much to Richard and to our panelists for all of their great insights on the um, various issues and questions we explored today. The second half of our webinar series will take place at the same time uh, on Friday, uh, October 2nd. And we look forward to seeing some of you there. Just before we end, I'd like to take this opportunity to make uh, a plug also for our faculty's Master of Law in Med Medical Ethics and Law program, which delves into a number of areas in medical ethics and law like this one today. So please visit uh, our website at CML to learn uh, more about the program and how to apply if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, have, a, have a very good evening or day, depending on where you are. And I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Thank you very much.